Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> Welcome to my SC22 opening talk for the panel on quantum computing and high performance computing. I'm titling it Hype Supremacy and Practical Quantum Advantage. I'm recording this based on popular demand, uh, many uh, tweets I have received after to, um, uh, to talk about this more in detail. So I just want to share this with all of you. I'm, Thomas Hanna and Matthias Treuer contributed a lot to this uh, way of thinking that I'm presenting in the next couple of minutes. So basically quantum computers from a high, uh, high performance computing perspective promise very large speed ups. So high performance computing is all about speed, high performance and running faster and faster. But actually most quantum programs recombine known algorithmic building blocks. In fact, many people say, including me, that there are only nine or 10 different uh, quantum fundamental quantum algorithms and everything else is just a recombination of those. The most famous one, the most applicable one, in fact, is amplitude amplification in, uh, in the, the context of Grover's algorithm. So here the idea is that you can basically invert any function um, using quantum interference um, with square root n iterations. So that is quite nice. In, in, instead of, I mean, where n is the output space, instead of uh, n iterations where you would basically need to look through all possible evaluations of that function. Another one is phase estimation or quantum random walks or quantum Fourier transform, which is the basis of the uh, so-called Shor's algorithm for uh, breaking today's cryptography or today's uh, cryptography that bases on the multiplication of uh, large prime numbers or on the hardness of prime factorization. Um, then there is Hamiltonian simulation, which is an, a very nice uh, set of algorithms where the idea is basically to simulate nature, to encode whatever nature is doing into a quantum computer and really simulate physical systems this way. So this is one of the clear ones that gives us exponential speed up. And then there are many others which may or may not be relevant for high performance computing. I want to highlight one, just our, our work. It's not a quantum algorithm, but it's a quantum system, quantum MPI, how you can actually run message passing uh, in distributed quantum computers that appeared at last year's uh, supercomputing SC21. But we are at SC22, so let's go back to quantum. I'm claiming that many of these top uh, row algorithms, so the vast majority of those, offer only a quadratic or low polynomial speed up. And this actually includes much of quantum artificial intelligence. So meaning that the speed ups are well polynomial and not super great. The bottom ones, or the bottom ones in fact, offer exponential speed up and some examples in the top ones as well, but many examples don't. So now the question is, what does this mean? Is exponential speed up needed or is quadratic speed up sufficient? This of course depends on the constants. This of course depends on the a particular performance model of the machine we are talking about. So specifically, let us design an optimistic quantum computer. Let us say we have 10,000 error corrected logical qubits. So this of course means that we need at least 10, but more like a thousand X more physical qubits. So it wouldn't be realistic today, but maybe realistic with some scaling. So we are also assuming that we have a 10 microsecond logical gate time that includes all kinds of error correction. I mean, at the end, we need to get to these uh, logical error corrected qubits. <coughs> We are optimistically assuming that we can simultaneously perform any gate operation on all qubits in a single cycle. Okay, so, so most designs don't look like this, but this is a very optimistic assumption. And we assume that all qubits are all to all connected. So really um, that we can apply two qubit entanglement gates between any two qubits without any limitations also in a single cycle. So this is a very, very optimistic quantum computer. Now, if we compute the IO bandwidth of this machine, uh, by the way, this may or may not happen in the, in the, na in the next uh, couple of years, this machine. I mean, we're pretty sure that it's most likely not happening in the next five years, but may happen in, in a larger time frame. Um, so now if we compute the I.O. bandwidth, um, we, have, we would use those 10,000 gates. We, we need at least one gate per bit read, right? And divided by our uh, gate time, that would get us one gigabit per second for this very optimistic quantum computer. Now, this is how, can, how fast we can read read and write data. I mean, mostly reading data because writing data um, is, is a different beast. So how, can, how fast we can, can we read data? So now the other question is how fast can we evaluate oracles on a supercomputer? Because oracles are somewhat classical computations that are needed as input to, um, to the, uh, on a quantum computer, I mean, sorry, oracles are classical computations that are needed as inputs to the quantum program. So for example, if you have a chemistry use case, 
um, then we would need to perform a certain number of floating point operations that, uh, depending on the, the chemical system described, may actually be quite demanding. So in this analysis, we only account for multiplication. So we assume addition and shift is free. Right? Okay. So uh, in, in the sense that for floating point numbers, we only count mantissa multiplications. Okay? So, so we only look at the parts of the computation to be, again, very optimistic for the quantum computer. So it's only paying for a, 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 the largest part, but only a part of the computation. We ignore all other overheads, like reversibility, where we need to add ancilla qubits, mapping to the physical machine, and all of those other things we ignore. Right? We, going with the best case for the quantum computer. So now if you look at the I.O. bandwidth, the operation throughput for various numbers, 16-bit floating point, 32-bit uh, floating point in binary, for a future quantum computer, so not today, again, uh, a very optimistic future quantum computer, we would get the named 1 gigabit per second I.O. bandwidth and uh, 10 to 235,000 operations per second for these um, um, yeah, floating point and, and binary operations. A GPU, we all know the numbers uh, that is extracted from an A100, so we get teraops per second and uh, 10,000 gigabit per second bandwidth. However, of course, now, now the GPU is clearly, clearly seems to be winning, but there, the key of quantum computation is not the raw speed, <laughs> as you can see, but the key is really the improved algorithms. So, for example, Grover is now finishing in square root n invocations instead of the classical n invocations. So it's much, much, much faster in terms of iterations. So we get a quadratic speed up. So now the big question is, does the quadratic speed up warrant these this sl much slower computations in practice? So as you can now imagine, as the problem size goes up, the difference between classical and quantum machines grows. So for small problem sizes, as you can see here on the, on the x-axis, the runtime of, of a classical machine is of course going to be better because the difference between quadratic speed up and um, non-quadratic speed up or, or, or linear um, ty processing time is not that big, even for exponential. For very small problems, you want to run those on a classical computer. It's pretty clear. But then as the classical algorithm scales either quadratically or exponentially, it'll at some problem size, which we call the crossover size, be more expensive than the quantum computer. And then of course, for all larger problem sizes, it will be more expensive. Right? It's just basics of scaling, uh, which you all know from your theoretical computer science class. So now of course, the uh, specific crossover size has a specific crossover time. And this is where we want to, uh, where we want to go here, because in, in this uh, little presentation, I'm arguing that, the, that if we limit the crossover time for two week to two weeks, at the end, quadratic algorithms are not very useful for this very optimistic quantum computer. But let me get a little bit more into detail if we now put these two machines to the test. So let's compare today's classical, today's single chip classical, so a single A100 with an optimistic quantum computer of the future. So single A100, I'm just summarizing the numbers again that we've seen, and then a quantum computer, I'm summarizing numbers again that we have seen, of course, the A100 thinks, well, I can easily beat you, uh, but the quantum computer has the argument, well, I only need, uh, I, I get a, a quadratic speed up in the number of invocations um, to solve the problem, <clears throat> okay? So now, if we assume a two-week runtime, we can now do the math, and this is all in the details in, in the paper that I have at the bottom here. Um, assuming this two-week runtime, how many instructions can the Oracle function, or is the Oracle function allowed to do such that the quantum computer outperforms or is basically the same speed, so this is the crossover, uh, crossover size, as an A100, as a single GPU. And it turns out that if we assume quadratic speed up, so Grover's algorithm, which is, by the way, the basis of most, uh, if not 90% of the quantum algorithms that have been published, the speed up uh, only allows 0.1 floating point operations or 71 binary operations, which is nothing. We cannot do anything useful with this, unfortunately. If you have cubic speed up, it gets slightly better, but even 25,000 floating point operations is, may not be enough for your real problem to be solved. So now, unfortunately, this somewhat, the vast majority of quantum algorithms fall into this category of quadratic uh, or low polynomial speed up. And it looks like all of quantum AI falls into this uh, category. So we should really focus our algorithmic thinking, our, our creativity, not on applying Grover to more problems. That is not very useful, applying Grover's algorithm to more problems. However, quantum computing, really, we need to think about how can we define a problem on small data 
and exponential speed up. So we need to develop more exponential speed up algorithms like quantum Fourier transform, like the Hamiltonian simulation, uh, the simulations that we already have. So with that, I'm, I'm finishing my little opening speech and I wanted to get to, to Sven, uh, Sven's question. He has been organizing this panel. And so he asked a, a set of questions. For example, what is the role of quantum from the perspective of HPC? Will quantum acceleration impact uh, augment or replace other accelerators? So I strongly believe it's not going to replace other accelerators. It's most likely going to augment them with additional quantum capabilities where we can offload uh, problems where the, algorithm, the quantum algorithms actually give you a realistic speed up. And it may also impact the architecture of those systems uh, to coordinate between those two types of accelerators now. So we now have CPUs, GPUs, and quantum accelerators, and maybe other machine learning accelerators and whatnot. So this will be a flurry of heterogeneous systems, and quantum will be one of those accelerators. Will quantum acceleration dominate and ultimately drive HPC? So from the current, from my current knowledge, it is unlikely um, because we don't know the algorithms yet to uh, replace many of the HPC simulations. So Hamiltonian simulation is great. Um, so that may be a field that is dominated by quantum computation once we get it going. Uh, many other fields like discrete event simulations or solving hard problems like the traveling salesman problem may or may not be in the realm of quantum computation. We shall see. Um, so now are we still too early or too, too late to think about integrating quantum computing uh, as it is still maturing, uh, integrating into real HPC systems? Uh, my answer to that question would be it is, it is not really clear um, because there is a quick development going on. We should certainly think about it at the conceptual level, but quantum computers are still developing as quickly as, as they can, basically. And if we build specific systems now with specific assumptions about today's quantum computers, these may not be useful for the future because, of course, the architecture of quantum machines may be shifting away. So I believe up to some extent we should be thinking about designs to integrate quantum into high performance community, but when it gets too much into the details of specific qubit architectures that may or may not be realistic for the future, then we need to be careful to not invest time into, into something that may not pan out. Um, then the last uh, question, what are the right metrics to compare classical and quantum computing and when is quantum computing more cost effective? This was exactly the first uh, part of my presentation, so I give you one particular example. Actually, my colleagues at, at Microsoft um, have been working on, on a general a generalization of this, um, assessing requirements to scale to practical quantum advantages. It's a performance modeling framework, how to argue about the performance of quantum computers in the context of the performance of uh, classical computers and how to really make a difference. So this paper just appeared a couple of weeks ago on Archive and is also available in, in Azure Quantum as the Azure Quantum Resource uh, Estimation Service. So you could actually run your own uh, quantum algorithms and, and assess their resources, which is essentially a performance model that allows you to answer the question whether it is more performance effective to run on a quantum computer or on a, on a classical computer. With that, I would like to thank you. I would also like to thank you, uh, thank the organizers of the panel for inviting me. And um, yes, see you all hopefully next year at SC23 in person. <laughs>